Welcome to the 40K Shop Talk Podcast, broadcasting live from the Manufactorum. I'm your host, Austin. Join me, my co-host, Rob. Join us as we talk shop about new codexes, units, army lists, and general strategies. It's 40K related. You'll hear it here. All right. Welcome. And uh, today we're going to talk about some terrain. How are you doing today, Rob? I'm doing good. Good, good. Yeah, this is a pretty, uh, pretty deep topic. We could go... We could go way off the deep end on this, um, or we could decide to just kind of skate over the top. But I think there's a lot of stuff here that people want to talk about that they probably don't get to talk about. Um, terrain is super important in ninth edition. Um, you've been playing longer than I, and I don't know if you want to go over some of the highs or low points from old editions, but um, I feel like there's a lot of rules here to talk about, and there probably didn't used to be a lot of rules. Yeah, I mean, so I would say that this is probably the first edition where they've gone so in depth with rules before it's kind of just been, you know, area terrain, cover saves, true line of sight. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I think when I, when I first started playing this game, there's a lot more like terrain blocking, like you'd have to imagine stuff. And then, you know, then they made the switch to the true line of sight, which, you know, a lot of people loved, a lot of people hated. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of changed what your terrain had to be. Additionally, I feel the just the the train in general has really kind of come up and I mean when I was a little kid I used to play with like videotapes and CD cases. Oh yeah. We've all talked about the shoe boxes and <sighs> yeah, the coke <laughs> bottles, you know, you kind of just made do with what you could because I mean the reality was there wasn't a ton of terrain available and the train that did you get like you did get was, you know, maybe like some cardboard pieces, some of the older stuff with the little plastic like walls that you'd kind of yeah. put together and build and then put the cardboard in, you know, it, they made an effort, you know, you know, everybody had those like hobby trees from the train sets mm -hmm. with the, the flock on them. Yep. You know, oh, so, I mean, train is really basic and over the years I've seen games workshop and a bunch of third company do a lot of, um, a lot of good things with train. Uh, GW train is as expensive as it is. I mean, you and I have talked about this a bunch. Oh, like, yeah. It, it feels like you basically could buy another army or you could start building a board. Yeah. But I will say, as someone who's recently, you know, started putting together a board with all the cool GW stuff, I'm a huge fan. I really like it. I think the newer train that they've done is 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 solid. Uh, and we, we could talk about that later if you want to. Yeah, sure. Um, we can get into that as we go through specific pieces. Um, definitely. But, but I mean, uh, there's, yeah, there's so, also tons of third party stuff out there too. I just want I want to throw that out there. Like there's the wood burning stuff. There's just yep. a ton of third party stuff. I mean, terrain in general has come such a long ways, and it's such a shame. You really need to put together a board that feels like a like a, a war zone, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I think that's very true. And before, um, like you said, it was it was just a, it was just about function. Can you see or not? But the game has evolved to be so much deeper than that now. Now, you know, not only can you see or not is an important question, but, you know, you're talking about things that influence how you move and approach enemy units. I think for the first time in a long time, you actually start moving your units to, like, hunker down behind pieces of terrain versus just say, I'm always going the straight line because it is my maximum movement number in inches, and that's what matters. Right. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so you're, you know, you touched on something earlier that I think is a good place to start. And the terrain or the board you play on, it really is another army. And all the stuff we're going to talk about today, it can get expensive. It can get, you know, you can cross this bridge with, you can throw money at it, or you can take a long time and build stuff by hand. You know, you can cut oh, yeah. foam and flock things and, or you can buy pre-built kits or you can, cast resin rocks you know you could do this a million different ways but what's important i think is that you think of it like a third army you have to put care into it right and a, and a good board really changes the nature of the game in general right there's a lot of armies that can can just table an opponent and there's some armies that you know need to get close and be able to charge if if you build up something that you got to maneuver through like you start taking away the bonuses of a lot of things and you really start i don't know I, 
changing the way list building comes in. Now, I know in yeah. the tournament scene, this becomes very difficult when you have to supply terrain for, I don't know, 90 tables, right? Sure. It's, it's a next to impossible task to have good terrain. And this is something that, I mean, it gets better and better every year, but you're seeing like a lot of L's, you know? Yep. Exactly. Um, a just lot function. Of just it's functional. It's tall. It blocks line of sight, and that stuff is fine. But I mean, I think what you and I are talking about is like building a solid table that you can throw in a Tupperware, drag with you to game stores, drag with you yeah. to your buddy's house. You can set it up and have like a full battlescape, and use all the different little rules and things. And it like it, it just changes the nature of the battle in general, and it makes games so much more enjoyable whether you're trying to play competitively or having fun you know having a couple beers with your buddy hanging out like yeah a good table just increases the enjoyment that you're gonna have yeah absolutely okay so um <clears throat> what i want to do is i want to start with the main rule book there's just a couple pages in here but uh this can get really confusing for some people. It's a lot of information and I want to boil it down just as I like sort of interpret it. Um, I know we, like we talked about before, we both started to build tables of terrain. You know, I know I've put together a few tables in the past and um, I've gone all out with theming. So, you know, and I've also done it with cut up pieces of foam. So I think we have a pretty good uh, breadth of insight on this stuff. So um this is straight out of the main rule book. I'll be including tidbits about the FAQ, but I want to break down this, at least how I interpret it, and maybe it'll help other people if that uh, if that's a thing um, that they can get out of this. So uh, they start by talking about terrain features. There's a lot of words here, but there's really only one takeaway, I think, to be honest. Um, everything is basically area terrain or an obstacle. They talk about things like hills, and that's just, you know, undulations in the natural surface you're playing on. Mm -hmm. Forget about those. The hills are almost not worth mentioning. It just means the table might have bumps in it. Maybe you're yeah. playing on some boards that have pre-molded bumps. I I've pretty much taken hills out of any of my tables yeah. at this point. Yeah, I don't think that there's any point in that. Um, and uh, they touch on buildings. Uh, buildings. Uh, they did a sloppy job here, but what they mean are fortifications and fortifications are things you probably don't see ever, but they are uh, units you purchase for your army in a specific detachment. Um, we're also going to skip those for today. I have a whole segment I'd love to do on actual fortifications, but um, like I think it's best to just avoid things. them, not to confuse them for, for right now. So buildings are units in your army. We're going to skip that. Hills we don't care about. Just think about the surface of your table, whether it's flat or bumpy. So that leaves us with obstacles and area terrain. Um, now, everything in the game is pretty much area terrain, except for the couple things we'll call it as obstacles. Um, think of obstacles as um, uh, like uh, barriers and pipes and small little debris that you add to the table that looks nice, but it's not like the first thing you put down. So obstacles are like the dressing, you know? It's like how you set dress the other stuff you already put down, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of leave obstacles for the end. The big stuff that everybody thinks about when you see buildings and, you know, giant structures, all that stuff is just considered area terrain. Um, so the terrain features section, it talks about all that stuff in detail with keywords and all that. We're just going to skip it. And all the stuff we're going to talk about here, just think of it as like area terrain or else a set dressing piece that also has rules. Um, so the real, the real magic of this system is uh, on the next set of pages, and they talk about terrain traits. Now, terrain traits, just think of them as like keywords or tags, you know, depending on what edition you come from. Uh, I know when I started in 6th edition, everything had keywords, and every keyword you had to go look up in an encyclopedia of rules, you know, and you had to find out what, what rage meant and what, you know, this meant. That's kind of what these terrain traits are. They're keywords you assign, you point at things on the battlefield and you say these, these things, these buildings and pipes and holes in the ground and big crumbled up rocks, they have these keywords. Um, and there's about a dozen or so keywords, uh, but that's really all the system is. And it's all purely additive. So whatever keywords you attach, you just get more rules. So you can keep this as simple or as complicated as you want to make it really. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? I this is one of those things where like train it, it gets a little complicated and stuff. So 
I actually kind of recommend just drawing up a little cheat sheet for your table. It's um, a great idea. Yep. Uh, I have one. It's like laminated. I keep it next to there. So anytime that we have a discussion, it's just, hey, I got this little laminated piece of paper here. We can look at it. And yeah. This was this, remember? And, and you know, you, this, you always want to have these discussions with your opponent at the start. And that in itself is usually a fun conversation as you kind of figure out what everything is going to be and how we're going to treat it. And um, like Austin said, you know, we, we just keep it pretty straightforward and kind of pick and choose. There's a couple ones that I really like and then some that I don't use as much. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, this is what's really cool about bringing your own too. you know, once you start to amass a collection of terrain and you start to take it to the store or, you know, people get used to playing on your terrain, having that sheet's really awesome because you can be like, look, you know, this thing's modeled up. It looks great. We both love the look of it. Here's the keywords, you know, you get a plus one here, you get a minus to this here. It's right there for everyone to see. Nobody's going to argue. Look, most of the time when you go to the store, nobody wants to set up the table. Everybody wants to just show up and play. So if you're the guy, or the girl, or whoever you are that shows up and sets up the table and has the laminated rules and you've made the terrain and you've painted it and maybe you have bases and you have little rocks and shit all over, everybody's just going to agree, you know? Right. So if you do the legwork, you'll understand it the best. You can help teach other people and it's already ready to go. I mean, people just want to show up and play, right? Yeah, I've never had anybody complain about that either because no. what I usually do is I try to get there maybe a little earlier and grab a table myself. I'll lay out my mat. I'll, um, I'll roll a mission even. Oh and yeah, dude. So that I can I can set the objectives up, and then I set up the train, and then when someone's like, "Oh, you know, I want to get a game in," I'm like, "Sweet. Well, here's the mission that we're gonna play here on this table. Uh, yep. You know, here's this that. Like, let's discuss this terrain. Let me explain everything. Here's my sheet, and you know, they're like, "This is awesome. Let's start." And I never have I had someone show up and say, "Let's reroll the mission," or "Let's do oh, this." Yeah. Like, people are always super excited to sit down and play at the table. You know, absolutely. Um, Yep. And I know that there's probably more to get into when it comes to preset tables for like um, tournaments and stuff. Oh, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to dig into that now. I, yeah. I think right now we're just going to keep it to, you know, what terrain, what, why use it, you know, yeah. why build it, why bring your own table and the bonuses and like how it improves your game. That, yeah, that's for sure. My thoughts. For sure. Let's stick to that. Um, You did mention something that is again, worth calling out is, uh, in all of the mission structures we know right now that GW has provided, um, there's a very specific order to the steps that you're supposed to do things in. And um, setting up the ter the table is actually a couple different steps, you know, you know, step five and six and seven or whatever. But, but the first part of that is actually to place the objectives. Like you said, that comes before terrain. And that's really important because um, you're not supposed to put an objective inside terrain. Like let's say you put down a forest you don't then put an objective in the forest. You actually set up the objective's permission and then you place the terrain around it. Right. So it it, 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 uh, you know, it gets rid of all these strange arguments that you used to have. It's like, well, my army's really good at being in forest, so I'm going to put all the terrain in the forest. Or mm -hmm. my army's really good at flying, so I'm going to put all of the objectives on the top floor of a building that you can't get to because you play knights, right? All that yeah, stuff is gone. Or back in the like white scar bikers. That, that yeah, was exactly. Thing. Or bikes, you know, like ride around while you look up at me sitting on the objective. So all that stuff is gone. So for people that haven't played previous editions, what a headache we've avoided. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the new edition, all the all the objective markers are kind of static. I mean, there's there's a little bit of tweaking you can do before the game starts, but we're not talking like it used to be where it's like, oh, we roll off and right. I place three objectives and you place two objectives. Like that's gone. Yeah, this is uh, this is extremely streamlined. You actually roll the mission. You know, step three is roll the mission. Step four is read the mission, which is great that they pointed it out. <laughs> However, that does include fixed objective placement. So step yeah. five is actually placing the objective marker. So for you know people like you and me that show up a little early, you could set the whole table up. It's outstanding. Or you can even set up the mission. You could roll the mission. You could place all the objectives. You know, outline the deployment zones for everybody, and then you know decide to place terrain together or have it all placed because there's no way you can game it. You can't screw the system in this edition. You can't put the objectives in places that, you know, the opponent can't get to. It's wonderful. Um, anyway, and the, 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 the best part about all that is um, if you do set up the table beforehand, it's still before play, uh, selecting secondary objectives. And we haven't talked too much about that, but that's really important because 
picking secondary objectives is a very tactical part of the game that you're supposed to do as a responsive action to when you know what the field is like, you know what the enemy's army looks like. So they really nailed it out of the park. This It's super easy to set up a game this edition. Um, so yeah, for sure. Uh, and it might be worth saying that all of the objective markers in this edition are 40 millimeter bases. And when you measure distance to them, you measure to the edge of the bases for what it's worth. Yep. So when you're setting up terrain, you know, an objective isn't a point on the field. It's a point within a base. So the terrain cannot be, you know, on that base. Um, so, but it does so let you do me, things. Part of me loves that. And part of me yeah. hates that. I, yeah. I kind of prefer the point on a map. So you just have a six inch diameter yep. template. I yep. hate the seven and whatever quarter that it is now with the 40 millimeter base, but it, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's true. I do. I do get that. I think that that's probably, you know, it's funny because you talked about like not moving. <laughs> Remember in the old, the old missions, you used, there was a mission where you used to pick up an objective and like run with it. The relic. <laughs> yeah. Yes, the relic. So now I guess it makes a little more sense. Uh, <laughs> you can't, can't pick up a base, but. I, I mean, I everybody kind of used poker chips anyway. That's kind of the standard. Yeah. Um but yeah. I, I never really had a problem with measuring from the center of a poker chip, you know. I mean, it was always pretty straightforward. Yeah. Most poker mm -hmm. chips started coming, like, if you go to a tournament or something, they give you chips. They usually put, like, a dot in the center as part of the graphic. So, yep. me personally, yeah. never had a problem with it. The, I guess the 40 millimeter maybe makes it less arguments at the table. Like, well, you're actually not quite in there. You didn't measure directly from the center. Like, I mean, I've... I don't know. I always use the little discs anyway, personally. So yeah, the little neoprene doesn't circles. Really matter. Yeah, yeah, those are lifesavers. But, so now we have to buy all new ones. What right, cool. exactly, and that's uh, that's my gripe. <laughs> I hate that. So I'm just being a yeah. grouchy old man, or I don't know what the word <laughs> no, is. it's cool, it's cool, dude. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a mat, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a mat cutter. So uh, oh, I will geez. buy new ones. So I've, I've cut all my mats. So I will inevitably cut yeah. and add to my neoprene you know, markers I, I i still have some six by four mats yeah um but i know the new age of sigmar is coming out once that drops and they change the size i'm gonna be cutting mats yep so anyway for, any, for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about they do make these neoprene circles that used to be exactly six inches in diameter so there was no measurement required you know if you are standing on this piece of mouse pad material you are on the objective and yep. it was super i don't know where it originally came from but most people have seen them by now so yeah, i got mine are like little plastic discs like yeah, almost plastic like, um, or, lam yep. like just a laminated disc basically I'm, I'm not even sure but if you don't have them i recommend finding them mm. and, and purchasing them there's a lot of like youtubers and stuff that stream games that sell that kind of stuff from the yeah. little shops like i highly recommend investing in some of those because you'd be surprised on how good it is and you know people are like so where's the objective like just stand on this disc if your base is on it you're scoring on it yep it's just it's super so easy nice. to count number of models too right yep. oh yeah. that's the that's the one thing that drove me nuts is yes. measuring the center of each model to the center of an invisible point that's underneath a model yeah, why games workshop doesn't print these i don't know dude they would make so much money this is it's, it's just crazy them. anyway Anyway, so terrain. you know what they could even do? No, you know what they could even do? <laughs> yeah, what's up? <laughs> they could even make a, they could even make a uh, completely flat um, base that's not beveled, that oh. has like a model in the center. Oh, for sure. They could do all kinds of stuff. I mean, oh, they sell man. the objective markers as it is. But, yeah, but... I mean... <laughs> It would be yes. really easy for them to just sell even I mean, cardboard, right? They they do the cardboard they box the cardboard piece things. now. All right. Anyway, okay. Come on, back to terrain. All right. This is gonna get. We're gonna derail a few times. I'm pretty sure. So, all right. Cool. <clears throat> so, we talked about the order of building things. We talked about okay. Yeah. So we're on the terrain feature. So these keywords. Back to these keywords. Um, these are called traits. So everything you place on the table can have a trait. If it doesn't, you ignore it. It's just there for visuals, right? So everything you place has a trait. And I would recommend that everything you do put on the table is something that you assign traits to. You give it rules. Because if you leave things that are undefined, it's just going to cause problems. So um, let's start with like what I think are probably the easiest and most common two, maybe two traits. And that's sure. light cover, right? 
Light cover is a trait that you attach to something, and it says you get plus one to saving throws against ranged weapons. And armor saves, armor saves. Um, and that's pretty simple. And that's sort of like what the old terrain rules used to just be. That was kind of it, right? <laughs> if you were you were in terrain, you just got a plus one to your armor save. So that's still here. So look, if you want to take this slow and you want to build a table and just assign one rule per piece of terrain and then start to layer on top of that, that's exactly what this system is built for. Um, so uh, my second favorite uh, is exposed position, which means you don't get cover. So I think those are really good ones to start with because you could say like, here's a giant piece of rock that I printed on my 3D printer and it's four inches by five inches wide and it's a huge cube. And I don't care if you stand on it because guess what? It's an exposed position, you don't get cover. That's sort of your null type, right? That's you assign exposed position to things that you want to ignore. So I think those are two really good ones to start with. Um, light cover plus one to save against range and exposed positions means ignore it. So, all right, yeah, so we sort of have our baseline then. You're either exposed or you're in light cover. Um, I think that the next one to talk about is probably obscuring. Would you agree? Um, obscuring is basically you can't see me. Uh, that's the best way to put it. It's like this yeah. building is so big that even if there's a small crack because the glue separated in the wall, you can't see me. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the the big one that everyone's talking about. Like, people love the obscuring; it allows you to hide stuff. You know, you move into it, you can now shoot stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I think most most people, when they think of ruins, they think of obscuring. Right. So, um, I think when we talk about these big tournaments and tables being set up, we talked about these L's, which are just giant L shaped bricks of styrofoam. You could easily see how you could build. Um, pretty much a whole tournament table system of foam cubes that are either obscuring, meaning you can't see me, or they're exposed position, meaning if you put your stupid tank on top of this wall, it doesn't matter, or light cover, you know? Hey, if I'm if I'm behind this wall, uh, I get a plus one to my save. So I think that's a really good baseline, um, and that's probably where most of the additions have been up until this point. So look, if you want to just play with those three rules, go right ahead. Uh, you're at a pretty good starting point. Now, um, we will talk about a couple other rules here, but for a minute, I want to go back to this idea of area terrain and obstacles. Um, area terrain, you know, they ask you for things to define a certain area of space. So we talked about a ruin. So I'm at, you know, go, go look up any GW plastic building kit or just Google GW ruins and you'll see a plethora of different, you know, administratum, stratum, sanctums whatever you want to call them, factorums, all these buildings that have walls with ruined corners, you know, and the floors are crumpling and there's windows everywhere. That's the stuff that they're talking about. So let's pick one of those. So you pick the administratum sanctum stratum and you decide that this is an obscuring piece of terrain. So if you're behind it and someone's on the other side, and even though there's a window or a broken, you know, a broken door, they can't see you. Mm -hmm. Um, that's a pretty good, I guess, use of it. And then you could say something like, if I'm standing on a ledge on the third floor and I'm behind a broken half wall and I'm in this building with a bunch of snipers, I'm in light cover. So I get plus one when you shoot me. So with the area terrain, I just I just want to note, uh, Games Workshop pieces, it, it might seem like a small thing, but every piece that they supply basically comes with a square footprint. So you have like the main piece and then you have like this little L wall piece, right? And a lot of people might look at that and say, well, what's the point of this little L piece? What that does is the way you build it is it establishes a square. If you use both pieces in conjunction, it establishes a square. And basically you and your opponent, and this is what I do, I say, look, you know, look at this. You can see it obviously is a square. If your models are within the boundaries of this imaginary square of this building, you are now in the area terrain of this ruin. And then yeah. I also use that as like how the line of sight works, right? The corners of the buildings. I mean, the thing makes a perfect square. This allows me to not have to worry about basing any of my terrain, which I yes. tried and it's, it's a mess and oh, it man. sucks. And, and it's something I used to really be all about, but now I hate it. If you build all your terrain, kind of how GW supplies you to be able to build it, or even if you use third party or whatever you do, this imaginary two L's that you put together makes this perfect little square 
to to basically you and your opponent can agree this is the area terrain yes Um, and i think that's really important that's a great point i'm glad you brought that up we don't have to go into the basing argument too much in depth but you're you're absolutely right the point is uh if you're lugging around a tote full of terrain you don't need bases anymore because you just define areas by where you set up the walls right you place the walls you're outlining it but yes uh, and that's important for obscuring because if you're inside the building you're not hidden by the building Um, so like if you imagine if you run in and run up to the windows to shoot out well if you're shooting out they're shooting in but if you're you know eight inches behind you know if the building is if you're eight inches behind the building and it's between you and the target it's obscuring both of you you can't see each other so it seems weird at first but just like put it on the table and look at it set up some models and look at it and it'll become pretty intuitive i think it is it is um so the, the, another one of these terrain features that I, I really kind of wanted to talk about is the obstacles. I know you were kind of talking about yeah. that before. And one of the things that I really like about this is they, they very clearly mark out like how close to an obstacle you need to be before you start benefit from it. Now, right. most people, when they think of obstacles, they think of um, like the, the manufacturing crates. And something that I like to do is in addition to the crates themselves, those crates come with the barrels and, and the yeah. ammo cases and stuff like that. So when I set up my, my crates, I also put, I, I actually glued a bunch of them together so that they're almost like little defense lines and walls and stuff. And the barrels are kind of all next to each other and some are tipped over, you know, and some are stacked yep. too high. Yep. And what I do is I, I, I pre glued them together so that they're like these little things that, I, as you called earlier, you know, battlefield dressing. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think I disagree with a little bit with that, but you, I mean, okay. yes and no. Um, because to me, these serve a purpose, these little pieces specifically, because I use them in conjunction with my crates to create little areas where the crates there. Yes. It can block line of sight. Yes. But now I got these little barrels or, or things that are kind of touching the crates and now my unit can run up behind it. You know, they mm-hmm. can get that cover with they're within three inches of this whole thing. This whole thing becomes this little three inch footprint. And then they use the ammo crates and the barrels and stuff to basically run up and hide behind. And now they get that like cover that they're being shot back at because the, those ammo crates and barrels are now going to block the line that you draw between the two units. Sure. And, and that's because you can't shoot through amp, uh, the, the, right. The containers. But yeah. if you use the stuff that comes with the containers to kind of create this little area that your, your unit can kind of get into and, you know, defensively set up. That's another thing that I really, really like to do. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, so just to take that example and run with it, those uh, this little line of uh, the shipping, the big shipping crates and the little barrels, we decide some traits to it. So it would probably have traits like light cover. Mm -hmm. So those little barrels and little knickknack pieces that have been glued in a line, you probably want them to have light cover so that you get the benefit. So when you get the benefit of a ter- of a terrain piece, like you said, when you're within three inches, you get the benefit. And getting the benefit basically means you start looking at the traits. So you now have light cover. So your your guys are running up, and you're getting plus one to saving throw from ranged attacks. You're probably assigning um, exposed position to the big crates, uh, so that you know if you're standing on top of them, you're not getting yep absolutely cover. Uh, what else are you probably assigning to well, these things? Well, so, so these armor containers actually come with assi- pre-assigned traits. So scalable is okay. another one. Scalable. Okay, and what's that mean real quick just to go uh, through stuff? Scalable is – let me flip to it. Scalable sure. means uh, – I mean the gist is that infantry, beast swarms, and fly models can be set up on top of it or in its move on top of the terrain feature. Okay. Models can move through the floors and ceiling on gantries. Um, basically it means that, you know, I think it's about three inches. You can run three inches up the – Okay, so you can pay movement – actual yeah. inches and go to the top and, of it and, and, and you know what and maybe that's useful um yeah. personally for these armor crates I, like i said most people will use these armor crates as just like a, a line of sight blocking they'll take four of them they'll stack them too tall they'll put them in like that l shape and be like now i have this line of sight blocking terrain piece and that's how most people use them i like to do that but also like i said you know use the light cover aspect of this by by incorporating the ammo crates in the barrels so now you got like a line of sight blocking slash defensible kind of position and i i really think this adds adds to kind of what you can do with your units with that piece and again all of this stuff there's no base so it all just kind of blends into your mat um 
we were talking about you know board dressing to me that's like if you like use like the lichen or like little rocks you Mm -hmm. kind of throw that stuff on there just to kind of make it look more real that kind of stuff i usually consider that nothing in fact i move it if it gets in the way like yep that's a great point it's just Just strictly there to make your board look pretty and honestly if you haven't tried it try it because you'll be really happy with the results that's yeah, um, kind of a, a side note, but let's let's get back to talking about the uh, the crates yeah. and different things. Yeah, I mean, you might want to give it uh, <clears throat> you might want to give it the terrain trait of defense line. Maybe I don't know. This is just a this is just a thought thinking out loud. Defense line is a trait that says um, basically you don't have to cross the the piece of terrain to fight. So right. if you're standing behind the barrels, which let's say are a half an inch thick, and um, someone charges you. They don't have to put all their models on top of the barrels and have them fall over into your models to fight you. They just charge the edge of the barrels and you just fight over them. You get two inches to fight each other across the barrels. Yeah, I I actually do do that with the the barrels and the ammo crates. And usually I have those also kind of sprinkled around the battlefield a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it it does kind of make this little defensible position that you can use. Um, I... (laughs) Funny thing is I, I usually sometimes will throw these also into my little footprints. So if yes. these are hanging out behind them in inside your area terrain, then I, I will also use them as this little defense line stuff. Uh, again, someone yeah. might be like, ah, that's overcomplicating it. But I, I don't know. I think it makes it fun. It, it gives you a reason to kind of put your dudes behind these little barricades and stuff. And Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. So that's, that's a good, that was a good, uh, little use case right there. Um, so I want to go to uh, another another type of terrain trait here that is, uh, I think, overlooked. Um, so in the rulebook, they do call out some common pieces of terrain and they assign rules. But uh, I want to talk about what we what we call craters. Um, mm-hmm. So you could imagine a crater as just, you know, a stamped out piece of resin or just, you know, literally a circle you printed out that looks like a tar pit or, you know, whatever. But a crater is really important because it exposes, uh, well, a new terrain trait that we call, or or like to put on it, called difficult ground. Right. Um, A lot of things can have difficult ground. Again, it's just a trait. So if you want to pretend that rivers, you have the, maybe you have rivers that flow across your board, or you have maybe even things that are just drawn on your mat that look like mud pits, You could call those difficult ground. And all it means is subtract two inches when making a normal move, an advance, a fallback, or a charge over this terrain feature. Unless you have fly, of course. And this used to be a big part of just basic terrain back in the day. Like terrain used to, every time you charge a unit in cover, you'd get that minus two to charge. Mm -hmm. And that was a big deal and people really hated it or loved it. I mean, it it, it hurt close combat armies, but helped shooting armies. And it, it was a big thing. And I love craters. You've seen my mm-hmm. boards. I like yep. to just sprinkle these things everywhere. These are great. I think I have like five or six of the plastic ones. And I just start throwing anywhere that there's like a big open area. I'm like, yep. I throw that thing down. Like, this is dangerous. If you're trying to run across an open battlefield, eh, think you might want to think twice. You might want to yep. maybe take the longer way around. Um, and, yep. and also something with these things is, you know, you have these buildings, like looking at the GW ones, you know, like I said, they've got these two pieces. The whole thing is messed up. Sometimes I like to throw a, a crater right in the middle of a building. So yeah, it's defensible and you get all these things, but if you're inside of it, good luck. Cause you're going to be moving a little slower. Yep. But also if someone tries to charge you in there, maybe they're not going to make that charge now. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Difficult ground is an amazing keyword. It's, it's, it can be controversial because people can be like, Oh, well, my army's all melee. So you just pick that so that I'll, you know, have trouble getting to you. What's interesting is you can say, you know, you look at this crater and say, okay, well, this crater has difficult ground, but you know what? What if we also assigned light cover to it? So now if you're in that crater, okay, yeah, you're going to get a minus to your movement, but maybe in our game, it makes sense to say, you know what? Plus one of your saving throw against range weapons if you're just completely standing with all your models in this crater. And maybe it's cool because it looks, it actually looks like it has raised walls, like a, a gigantic foxhole, right? So that's the cool thing about this. You can just slap on these trait keywords to make things more balanced. Maybe there's a lot of buildings in your, on your, I'm sorry, maybe there's a lot of ruins on your table and uh, they all look like they are completely collapsed, you know, and there's debris everywhere and there's rocks everywhere. You say, hey, look, all of these ruins, yeah, they're light cover and all these other things, but you know what? Maybe they're also difficult ground, like you said. Um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do there. So difficult ground is big. Uh, 
Use it to balance your games and don't be afraid to use it. Um, do not leave this one off the table. Um, since we did touch on ruins a few times, we talked about ruins having light cover. And this is just your typical GW kit, right, for a building, um, for some sort of structure. Talked about light cover and scalable, which means you can move up the different levels. Um, a couple other things that are kind of cool to add to your ruins. Um, well, breachable is a common keyword as well. I think that they recommend all it means is that infantry and beasts and the little stuff can move through the walls. Like, you know, imagine them climbing through windows and stuff. So uh, that's definitely there. But something else I like to add to the building sometimes is um, is heavy cover. So heavy mm -hmm. cover, we talked about light cover, plus one to save against ranged weapons, um, or armor saves. Well, heavy cover is basically a version of that that says... Um, Plus one to save, plus one to armor save against melee weapons. Um, there are some caveats to that. We'll go into it. But think of it just as like, um, you know, maybe if your board is super dense and you're playing a bunch of heavy melee armies, uh, you don't really care about shooting each other. You just want to get that, you know, care about who charges who, get that combat save up. So you can just assign heavy cover to stuff. So don't forget about that rule either. Yeah, so... There's actually a couple different really nice ones here that, you know, some some things that we're not really talking about. Um, defensible, dense cover, and heavy cover. I, I, I like to yeah. think of all three of these. Each one of them is a little different, but they all do really nice things. So heavy cover, like you said, it's the plus one saving throws against melee weapons unless that model made a charge move this turn. Yeah. Um, so that one's really good. And something also to think about, there's a lot of armies that ignore cover rules. Yes. When they do things. So having these little extra things also makes some of those other rules a little more important. I'm not saying, oh, you, you know, build an army to take advantage of this. I'm just saying there's certain units in the game that may seem kind of lame at first. But once you start putting all this terrain on the board, yeah. all the stuff starts doing stuff. Some of those units that start ignoring these things start becoming a little more um, wanted. Uh, yeah, and remember, ignoring means all the traits we're talking about go away. So they take right. away these these keywords. Um, but so defensible is another good one. So oh, I love this one. Yeah, infantry units can uh, hold steady or set to defend. So if you hold steady, you get a plus. Basically, your Overwatch is on fives, which is can yeah. be good. Set to defend cannot fire Overwatch, but instead add uh, one to hit rolls in the next phase. I think that one's really good too. Yes, I think that's a it's a really neat little addition. So. You know, if you're getting charged, you might make the the, the best out of a, a bad situation. Um, dense cover is another one. So subtract one from hit rolls made against ranged weapons if it's at least three inches tall. It yep. does not apply to models that are only shooting through their own terrain feature. No penalty for shooting aircraft, whatever. Right, so this one right. is also good. Yeah. Now, something, so... something that I just real quick, I just want to say there's something that you've shown me that I, I thought is, is really cool uh -huh. is there's a lot of those GW makes those, uh, those Mars pieces, like the big gas tankers or whatever that have like the yeah. legs and stuff. Yeah. And not, a, not always does a forest make sense to put into a futuristic setting. Right. So these things are perfect because, you know, they got the tall, long things like trees and, a lot of a lot of times, you know, you're like, you know, let's play with the, the bottom of this to be counted as like a woods, not really a woods, mm -hmm. but, you know, we start get assigning the bottom of this terrain feature to have these like def uh, dense cover and defensible. And then the top of it, we say, OK, but the top, though, is is more of a heavy cover if you're behind like yeah. the little the wall things and and this. So you can actually start assigning like very special things to terrain pieces that at first glance you might be like, ah, that's a worthless piece. I'm never going to use that. Well, now you got this piece that if you're behind it, you're, you know, getting a minus one to be shot at. If you're on top of it, you're getting a plus one, your armor save. So there may be a reason to scale the five inches to the top of it. Right. Absolutely. And it's, it's, it's more than just being like, oh, this is just yet another line of sight blocking terrain piece. Right. Exactly. So, yep. So, you're starting to add more and more flavor to your board and give more and more purpose to these pieces than just it's a thing on the board, right? Everything is starting to now have more and more meaning. Yep. You know, the, uh, the, man the gantries or whatever they call them, you touched on the manufactorum kits that came out with Necromunda and Kill Team mm -hmm. way back in the day, all the cool walkways and, you know, they have these dangly bits and there's all these support legs and stuff. Um, 
those uh it's it's a funny story because you know here uh here uh, we have the citadel and they have a huge a huge table here that is like it's got to be like three thousand dollars worth of those gantry pieces and no one plays on it because nobody knows what to do they're like it's a shooting gallery and i'm like well this table is actually like a you know a melee army's dream because i do the exact same thing you said if you're shooting under these gantries and there's wires and chains and skulls hanging down and there's all these support legs underneath this is all dense cover so trace the gantry ways and if you're shooting under the gantries it's all dense cover there's minus one to hit everywhere so yeah you're absolutely right you can just you can assign these traits it's you know it's not like you're you're saying this has to be a forest you're not doing that anymore you're not naming things you're giving them traits uh, it's wonderful if you know how to use it. Right. Yeah and, yeah. and and that's that's the whole point, right? This is what we're trying to convey. Like the common terrain features makes it real easy at a glance to be like, this is yeah. how this piece of terrain is going to function. But it's it's better to just take the keywords and then start assigning them to things as they make sense. And, yeah. you know, like you might have like the, the big church piece, right? Mm-hmm. It's got like the whatever. Like that could be inspiring. It could be an inspiring yeah. piece of terrain. Yep. There's no That's reason. Great, it yeah. Just need to what be. is that? What is inspiring doing in leadership? Uh, it's plus one leadership, I believe. Yeah. yeah. That, that's amazing. That, and that could really help some armies, right? Right. Yeah. So, that's I mean, great. And, and it like it doesn't even matter, right? Like those neck arm pylons. If you own those, you can throw those on the board. You don't have to pay for them. Yep. And be like, you're on a Necron home world, and these obelisks are here, and they're inspiring. You know. Hell yeah. Not just to you, but you know, maybe this is like your opponent, you know, oh, we took we took this thing. Exactly. There's a different definition for what inspiring could mean. That's absolutely awesome. Yeah. The invaders so, could be inspired because they took it. Exactly. Yep. You, you need to I, I think this all comes down to like when you're working with your boards, you know, read through these keywords, understand them. They give you these nice little bullet points so you kind of get the gist of them. Um Pretty much everything in the game, in my opinion, is either going to be an obstacle or an area terrain. Um, mm-hmm. Like you said, like we don't really care about hills. I mean, if you got them, fine. Buildings don't really care about buildings all that much. Um, so for me, I pretty much break things down into it's either an obstacle or it's area terrain. If it's an obstacle, that usually means that it's like crates or boxes or whatever, a barricade, a line, defense yeah. line. If it's an area terrain, it's a crater or it's a, a building that has like the two L shapes to, to, to create a footprint. Um, and then we, I just to start signing these terrain traits. And um, I mean, geez, like exposed position is, like you said, is a really good one because you can start sprinkling those into the tops and stuff like that. Uh, if you really yep. want to get crazy about it, you know, you could say, well, if you're out, if you're standing on top of this, this thing, like it's a ruin piece, but if you're on top, this top level, sure. You get line of sight, but you are exposed because there's nothing there on top of that to block yep. you. You're just literally standing in the open and there's nothing stopping you from doing that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, you know, maybe nobody goes up there, but now that sniper team, they got to think twice about it. They want to get to the very right. tippy top to get that good shot off. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I mean, uh, using it to balance the game, right? Mm-hmm. And there are some nuances with all these things, you know, we're talking generically, but there are bullet points in the, in the rules, go read them about, you know, does this apply to a flyer or, you know, a, a, right. like an airplane, or does this apply to a unit with 20 wounds? Like just go read all those tidbits, you know, we're talking in generics here, but yes, there are, there are exceptions. Like you, you can't hide certain things behind obscuring models if there are so many wounds and all that stuff. But, you know, we're just, we're just touching on this stuff for the, for the flavor aspect of things. Um, yeah. Now, <clears throat> I did want to get go back to one thing you brought up earlier about defensible. This is something that uh, people might not really key in on if they're just kind of learning the rules from a friend or whatever. But um, you talked about two two terms. You talked about holding steady. You talked about Overwatch. Um, so just so people know, in the movement phase, when you select a unit to move, um, I'm sorry, set it to defend or hold steady is what I meant to say. So when you select a unit to move in the movement phase, you can choose not to move that unit. And if you've done that, uh, you can choose to make that unit hold steady or set to defend. Now, hold steady, you can, it's, it's common parlance just to say, look, if I didn't move a unit, it, it held steady. But what that actually means is when you look at defensible traits on terrain, um, if a unit holds steady, 
it hits on Overwatch on a five plus. Well, that's a big deal for some armies. So if you're an army that likes to hold still and take advantage of this, just make sure you announce like, look, I'm intentionally not moving this unit. It's holding steady. Mm -hmm. Actually, so, I just got a big deal. I'm just going to butt in there real quick. Actually, when you get charges, when you declare whether you want to hold steady or set to defend. So okay. you can actually run up into that piece in your turn. And then when your opponent charges you, you actually get like a charge reaction from that piece. So okay. in reaction to the charge declaration, you can choose to hold steady or set to defend. So it's a lot better than you even think. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Well, that's, yeah, see, that's good to know because I thought it was a movement phase uh, option. So definitely read those little pieces. Some of the words are highlighted or key, you know, bolded, but, or, or set the capitals, but yeah. Okay, cool. So that's a big deal then. Um, yeah, make sure you're aware of that if that's a rule that works for you. So um, cool. Okay, uh, I think that's most of the traits that we wanted to talk about. Um, I, I did have like a, a sort of tangent I wanted to go into. Uh, now it might be an okay time for it. Um, I wanted to talk about like making up rules and like making a campaign and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, before, if you're building your own table and, you know, if maybe it's really themed and your, you know, your campaign is always, you know, it's always a fight because I always play Nurgle on a polluted planet and you always play Marines. So you're always invading these planets that are full of toxic waste and all that. Right. So maybe it, it might be hard to find terrain that looks like it would fit in that campaign setting. So keep in mind, you can assign these traits in any order you want to things that you make yourself. So maybe instead of craters, you make or you find little bubbling pits of goo. Well, you could assign those all of the rules you would normally assign to a crater. It could be, you know, it could, and who, who knows, it could even be things like, maybe you don't have trees lying around, but you decide that these bubbling pits of goo are dense cover. So maybe there's a bunch of toxic gas that's coming off them. So if you shoot over them, you get a minus one to hit. So you can build your theme tables with all these different rules any way you want, right? You don't have to go scour the internet for trees that actually look like, you know, neural toxic trees just because you want something to be dense cover. Mm -hmm. So you can invent stuff that fits your themed table uh, pretty easily with these traits. And you could never do that before because it was always an argument with your opponent. You know, you say, well, I can, you know, I can only you know, declare these forests as forests because they're actual tree models that GW made, you know, keep that stuff in mind. Um, and I've done that a lot. And again, you know, I talked about being at the Citadel, but there's another table there that uses miles and miles of these, of these pipes. And that's all it is. It's just these pipes and it looks amazing. Right. And it and it makes kind of like a maze that you could walk through. Well, that looks really cool, but functionally people would look at that and be like, well, this is unplayable. Right. Well, one thing you could do is you could say, look, you see all the pipes that are blue with plasma maybe they put off some sort of aura where you can't um, you can't just shoot me clearly over it. Maybe it's dense cover. So anytime you're standing behind a, uh, a pipe that's glowing with these, the, the blue plasma pipes, maybe it's minus one to hit. So you can assign these rules however you want to make your table feel kind of themed if you're playing a, a campaign or something more fluffy. So. Yep. Um, and, and easily like, especially with those, those fuel pipes, a lot of times they have like those breaks in them, you know? So yeah. you could say like, oh, this whatever gas is leaking out and it's kind of fogging up the area. That's why it's a minus one to hit. Right. So yep. personally, I, you know, I, I we've had conversations, you and I, about, about those gas lines. I'm not a huge fan of them. I can see where they would be useful. But personally, like, you know, my, my favorite things are like, like I said, like ammo crates, barrels, uh shipping crates i like buildings yeah. i like we haven't even talked about um i use so one of the things that i use for like a forest piece right like a dense cover minus one to hit thing is i really like the the, the gw set piece with the cranes yes so like just leftover like industrial equipment that's sitting around i treat that kind of stuff too as like a forest right because it's not really something that your guys are going to be like hanging out in you know hunkering down is like a thing but you know a couple of random shots through there is probably going to ricochet off of like the tractor tread or something so oh yeah I, I i basically make a little circle footprint with like with the crane and like it comes like with two little haulers and i think, I think it comes with some barrels and i just kind of make you know using like the ammo crates and the barrels and stuff i kind of make what is like a little circle area and i'm like this is what essentially is a forest 
Yeah. And that makes more sense on my, you know, Mars industrial world than, than trees do because those don't make no sense at all. Yeah, exactly. Great point. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then also I, 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 there's one more thing that's not really in the rules, but a lot of people play with, and that's, uh, I, I just, just briefly want to mention is impassable mm-hmm. terrain. Mm. Right. That's not that's something, fair. there's no keywords, there's nothing about it. And, um, I, I feel like this is a very common thing. Uh, sometimes I'll use like a, a bastion as, as something that I just say, this is just here. It's impassable. You can't go into it. It's nothing. It's just yep. a thing. Yeah. You know, uh, maybe you have like some sort of rock spire. Everybody has seen like with the, the foam cutting, you can make the little rock spires, things like that. I like also to just kind of maybe throw on the board and say, you know, this is impassable. It's just here. You can hide behind it. It blocks line of sight because we play with true line of sight, but it doesn't really have any other additional rules other than it's just this thing. And yeah. that's something else to, to kind of think about too. Yeah. It's another good knowable type to knowable trait to throw on things, to cancel out problems, you know, like something trying to balance on this oddly shaped resin rock. Well, look, dude, this is impassable. You know, don't even bother trying. Let's not even argue about how I fight you because it's five point three inches tall on one side that slanted down and now you're standing on it. Boom. Impassable. Yep. Um, and then you were saying something about like, uh, like customizing boards and stuff. And, you know, yeah. some of the things that I've been kind of thinking about recently is, you know, I have this, I, I personally use a lot of the GW train recently and I built like a whole Mars, like manufactorum kind of planet. But, you know, I was having conversations before it's like, well, you know, what do you do for chaos? And it's like, let me tell you, Right. So you already, let's say you have your Imperial world. All right. So here's how you make it a chaos world. They have that really cool iron stargate thing, you know? Yes. So you can just drop that bad boy in the middle and then you can 3d print or whatever, and just get a bunch of bodies on pikes. Oh my God. Just start field dressing up your Imperial city (laughs) and be like, bam, we are now a chaos infested. Oh, that's so Imperial cool. City. It's just a forest of human bodies on sticks. <laughs> or like they could be your barrels, right? They are your right. barricades. They, yep. They, they oh, could be man. all kinds of things. What a and cool visual. It's, um, it's an easy way to take a big investment and completely with just a little bit of dressing and maybe one or two pieces completely change what your new battle board looks like, you know? That's um, a great That's point. another reason I don't like bases because I can paint yeah. that and then I can put them on any mat. Yep. And and maybe just swap out like one or two pieces because like once you what it, it's it's really addicting once you start getting into the trade game, um, but oh, yeah. again, so if you if you're not basing it, you don't have to worry about painting the base to look like <sighs> what it's supposed to be. Um, slate rock and stuff like that to sprinkle on the board makes great looking rubble. And yeah. again, like I said, you can swap out a few pieces here and there. You know, like how easily could you like if I had, let's say I I started working on that Nurgle board. There's no reason I can't just drop a couple of those like bubbling pus pools and throw them around and be like, now it's a Nurgle board. Maybe I get a different game mat to throw down. Yeah, um, that's oh, we didn't even talk about mats, but what a great starting point, right? Get a game mat. Yeah, get a get bunch. A game mat. Yeah, man, um, so cool. Um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so there are there are a couple like technical nitty gritty like scenarios I wanted to talk about just as like maybe one of our closing points here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the, the difficult terrain where you get minus two to your, you know, move advance charge all the time. One thing you don't get minus two inches uh, on is like consolidations, pile ins and disembarkments from a transport. Now I learned this lesson the hard way because I do, I play Harlequins uh, as another one of my primary armies and uh, this edition was a really big wake up call for them in terms of their flip belt. So um, the flip belt is kind of like having fly. You move over stuff, except you don't actually have the keyword fly. Most of the time, that's just strictly a boon because things that target fly don't target you better, you know, flak missiles and all that stuff. However, when it comes to terrain, the only keywords that the terrain rules call out is actually having fly. So when you're charging through a forest with harlequins even though you have a flip belt um you uh unless the flip belts have been eroded to completely ignore it uh, you get minus two now regardless the point i'm trying to make is one thing you don't get minus two is your consolidations 
So there are traits that give certain models in the army bonuses to consolidation. So just like you said, ignoring cover now has more value. So does things like that. If this, if, if you play on a board that has a lot of craters, a lot of things that are considered difficult terrain, maybe uh, it's worth taking uh, traits and tactics that increase your piled in moves and your consolidation moves because you'll get to um, consolidate out of a piece of terrain possibly that would have uh, prohibited your movement next turn. There's a lot of little things to think about with that. You know, you could be scrapping inside a, uh, a crater and next turn you're going to want to use your full six inches or eight inches of movement. So maybe you leave yourself a little bit of room so that when you consolidate after you kill that unit, you can make it outside that crater for next turn. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's uh, really, really tricky. Uh, and it's the same with disembarking a transport. Uh, right. If you move a trans or I'm sorry, if you disembark it from a transport, you get like three inches or so, right? When you come out, that's not prohibited. So you're not going to get one inch if you disembark into a crater, but you might get, you know, minus two inches if you begin to move then after disembarking. So you can kind of game it a little bit, but keep that in mind. So you can use all of those movement tactics to your advantage. Um, and the player that can master the terrain in the moment too, you're going to have such a big advantage on people. If you really want an upper hand, and you've already learned all of the rules for all the armies. I think that's probably step one is learn all the all the rules for the terrain and learn how to play around the terrain because you'll get you'll get a big boost to your uh, to your win win percentage. I bet. Yeah, I mean, you know, win percentages and all that. I mean, that's good. To me, the the terrain just makes the battles more enjoyable, right? You know, if you're if you're trying to play diehard competitive tournament scene kind of stuff. Yeah. All this stuff really. I, I, most tournament players would probably complain about this. Oh, it's making it too random or, you know, it's doing this or that. Right. I mean, this is for football players out or you know, people that like watching football, you're like talking about playing in cold weather versus the dome and like what, what it means to have the Super Bowl in cold weather and oh, yeah. this, that, and the other, like, let's just take all the conditions out of it and make it a fair fight. Well, there's no fair fight in 40 K. And honestly, yeah. um, things like, you know, we're talking about the, the difficult terrain and the minus two and, I think I mentioned earlier, right? Throwing those craters, just basically any type of open area on the board, you start throwing craters into. It's a big deal when someone can really only put their transport around those craters and then it gets blown up and their only option for deployment is maybe putting that unit near the crater. Like I'll, yes, you know, yes. <laughs> crap. I have to deploy it. Now my dudes are going to be slow to come running out here. Like, Oh, it yeah. really impacts the game, and in my opinion, it impacts it in a positive way to make it, I don't know, um, you're invested more, right? You have to think about yeah. your movements more. You have to think about what's going on. You can't just throw your units forward, jump out, and charge your, you know, I, I, I constantly think about my Dark Elder in this situation, mm -hmm. Drakari. Um you know, people are like, oh, they're so good. You can't. Well, yeah, but as soon as like there's craters everywhere, you know, witches aren't necessarily jumping out and charging you immediately. And there's all kinds of stuff that starts coming into play and you really have to start playing around it. Maybe you can't maneuver things the way you would like to. You can't just keep everything bunched up in a death murder ball, like things like that. And I feel like yeah. you just kind of got to play it to, to believe it kind of thing. Yeah, but for sure. In my yeah. opinion, may, maybe not great for tournament scene, mainly because of what it means to build boards like that for 90 tables. But if you're going to the game store on your Wednesday night, Thursday night, whatever, I, I just, just try it, play it. I guarantee you, you'll love the results. And you and the person you're playing with are just going to get so invested into the game. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. I think the tournament thing is very difficult, but I think like whenever you get, a, get away from calculated pre-canned like tactics, you right. get, things just get better. Like if you look at an army and you say, okay, we're 24 inches apart and I've calculated all of this army's min max move specs based on an empty battlefield. You know, if you say, you know, well, this unit can, <clears throat> Knights is, I would just keep coming back to that because it's so easy, but like you could imagine like the old flying circus lists and stuff with where you just play big demon princes or five keeper of secrets. Well, okay. Yeah. There's 24 inches between us and maybe you move 12 
and, and, you know, advance and blah, blah, blah. And then you need a three inch charge, which you can't fail because you get plus one. That's a straight line. But number one, you can't expect me to tow the line with you. And number two, even if I do, there's probably something in your way. And in every previous edition, there was never a rule that actually said, you know, look, this stuff has to obscure your movement. This stuff has to mean that you can't just pre-calculate every turn, you know, your exact direct line movement. And as soon as you take that stuff away, it starts changing things like, okay, well, what does this army do if it can't turn one charge every game because there's terrain? Right. And that's the stuff I think we need to make sure we keep a hold of in, in tournament play because a lot of the people you hear talk about that stuff, it's always like min-max this because turn one charge, or min-max this because it's guaranteed 20 inches movement straight to the enemy. Yeah, but you know what? I'm going to put a crater right in the middle of that table, and now you're not ever going to get a turn one charge. Now does your army fall apart? I don't know. Maybe that's right. important. I, I mean, for me, every every move I make or my opponent make, I'm the reason I like this game and have loved it for so many years is it's a mental exercise. I'm constantly yeah. calculating all the like as many variables as I can think of. I'm I'm constantly assessing which threats I need to deal with. I mean, it's a constant calculation and once you start throwing in the battlefield terrain and, and stuff like that i'm i'm considering moves and you know i find myself maybe in unfavorable positions sometimes but i i enjoy that okay i didn't want this to happen i took a risk to try to you know get this you know movement in here but now my opponent was able to take out my transport now my guys had to disembark into this terrain what does this mean how what do I do? Do I, you know, hunker down and, and get the save and return fire? Do I keep running forward? What's my best option here? And in a strategy game, which that's what we are playing, mm -hmm. having to adjust my strategy on the fly to evolving scenarios is why I enjoy playing this game. So if I just set all my stuff up on the uh, on this vanilla board and all we really are using is line of sight blocking terrain and uh, maybe the plus one cover and that's it. That's all we're doing. Yep. I, I, I'll be honest. I mean, that's a little boring to me. I can't, I, I, I can't think about how to use these things in my advantage. I can't, you know, take maybe this unit that's going to be under a, a unit that would be considered unviable against another unit right like i'm holding the flank with this well now i can start looking around okay well what do i have that can can push the favor like you know mm -hmm. what can what can i swing my favor in here okay i can yep. do this and maybe i can squeak out a you know it's going to make this unit harder to kill and maybe i can hold this objective on the flank while i push the other flank with my army you know it's stuff like that that makes this game awesome and why i love it and to just be like eh we don't really play with terrain it, it makes me sad. It's so sad. It makes Once me people sad. try it, oh it's, my god! It's like it's like showing up. At, let me put it this way: when you first started <laughs> playing 40k, you probably just show up and be like, "Let's just throw our models on the table and shoot each other," and yep. that was probably cool. But then you start playing with objectives, and you're like, "Oh man, I don't know why anybody would just throw their models on the board and start shooting each other." <laughs> exactly. There's no game there. The whole point is objectives. Well, the next phase of that is terrain, right? Once you yep. start playing with it, once you start utilizing the rules there, and I know it's probably a lot to take in when you first start doing it, but it just makes the experience so much more enjoyable. And yep. I, I, honestly, that's probably a good place to end it. You know, if you have any comments or you agree, you disagree, leave your comments below and let's, sure. let's talk about it. But I, I'm telling you, if you haven't done it, do it and you'll love it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.